Most people have heard of phytoestrogens, but did you know there are beneficial phytoandrogens that mimic and support testosterone and more? The top source of these is pine pollen. If you're looking for 100% natural hormonal support for men and women, you've got to try this. Right now, Lost Empire Herbs best-selling pine pollen is available for one penny plus shipping and handling. Go to GeniusPollen.com to find out more and grab yourself a bag today. No hidden charges, no trial offer, no shenanigans. Just a low-cost way to try Lost Empire Herbs' top product for next to nothing. Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have uh, Dr. Daniel Z. Lieberman. He's the author of The Molecule and More and a new book called Spellbound. We're going to talk about the unconscious mind and his books and, and his work. And so, Daniel, thanks for coming. Thanks so much for having me. If you would, tell me about your current work and studies. What are you focusing on at this moment? Well, I'm a psychiatrist. I'm on the faculty at George Washington University. So I get to do a combination of teaching, patient care, and writing. And right now, I'm anticipating the release of my new book, Spellbound, that's coming out August the 23rd. And what's the new book about? It's about the unconscious mind. I think that's a concept that a lot of people have heard about, typically in connection with Sigmund Freud. But I think that the vast majority of people have no idea the enormous role the unconscious mind plays in their life. So the book is written to help people appreciate their unconscious partner, give them a sense of what it is, what it does, and how they can pretty much team up with it to enhance their lives in so many ways. I guess to start with, I have a weird question. Subconscious mind versus unconscious mind. I hear the two used by different people in different contexts, but what's the difference? Psychiatrists and other experts generally use unconscious mind. And the reason is that it's non judgmental. You know, sub means below. And when we speak, it's usually the conscious mind speaking, and we're sort of speaking down to our unconscious partner, which is probably not a good idea because we need to treat it as an equal. And so I prefer unconscious. Okay. But either can be used. Yes. As though they might be different things. Gotcha. So I don't know, what is the typical role the unconscious mind plays in someone's daily existence? Sure. So I think that when we think about our bodies, most of us are comfortable with the idea that we're not in full control of our bodies. Sometimes our bodies get tired, they hurt. Sometimes we can't move as fast as we want, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But when it comes to the mind, we sort of have this illusion that we have a lot more control than we really do. Now, on the one hand, I can choose to think about whatever I want. I, I can think about what I'm going to wear tomorrow, what I'm going to make for dinner. And so it feels like I can control my thoughts. But if you go a little more deeply, I think what you find is that most of the important stuff that goes on inside your mind is completely outside your control. And there's so many examples, but let me give you a very simple one. And that is the example of desire. A, a lot of our lives are directed by trying to get the things that we want. It could be a new cell phone. It could be a career. It could be a relationship. And we have no control over the things that we like. So for example, I may want to be a teacher more than anything else. And I may have a passion for being a teacher, but mm -hmm. I kind of realize that teachers don't get paid all that much. So I say, you know what? It would be better if my passion were to be a computer programmer because they get paid more. Well, I can't change that. I have absolutely no control over that at all. Uh, it's the same thing with partners. How often do we hear about people wanting partners who are totally inappropriate for them, totally destructive for their lives, but they can't change it. Even something as simple as your favorite color, your favorite food, 
These are things that are not determined by your conscious mind, but by your unconscious, and they have a profound influence on the choices you make and how you live your life. So do you have instruction on how to harness or use your unconscious mind? Or is it more of just understanding how it works or the interplay between conscious and unconscious mind? Like what, what was your goal in, in writing the book? Yeah, well, harnessing it is a big issue. And before we get to that, I think it would be useful to think a little bit more about what it does. So let me give you one more example of what it does. And that is that it determines our level of interest, enthusiasm, and energy. You've probably read all kinds of books and blog posts about how to increase your energy, right? And everyone's mm -hmm. got their own, their own theory. They've, they've got nutritional supplements. They've got behavioral strategies, all kinds of things, hundreds, maybe even thousands of ideas. But I think we all know that aside from eating right, exercising, and getting enough sleep, none of those other things really have all that much effect. And that is, is because this is something else that comes from the unconscious that we can't directly control. Some days you, you sit down to work and the ideas are just bursting and, and you're typing away like crazy at the keyboard and all kinds of good things are coming out. Other days you're sitting there and, and there's nothing at all. You, you just want to lay your head down on the desk and take a nap. Mm. That's one of the most valuable things that happens to us when we get that mental energy, because not only does it help us achieve our goals, it also feels great when, when that energy is absolutely surging through us. And so I think that one of the things that's important to recognize about the unconscious mind is that in some ways it can give us superhuman powers. The unconscious mind is responsible for creativity. You know, you can organize data into a spreadsheet. You can manipulate existing information, but you can't choose to come up with a creative idea, something brand new. That comes from the unconscious and that can change the course of your life. Sometimes it can change the course of the world. Another thing that comes from the unconscious mind that's amazing is love. Anybody who's fallen in love knows that it makes you feel like a god on earth. Everything is different. Everything is wonderful. And again, that's not something that we can summon up at will. We have to hope that it's going to hit us, enjoy it when it does, and recognize that it's not going to last forever. We have to enjoy it while it can. Uh, while we can. So the unconscious mind is capable of making us feel superhuman, making us perform at levels that we are incapable of on our own volition. But we don't want to fall into the trap of thinking that the unconscious is all good. It's also a powerful force of evil. Just as our desires and our loves come from the unconscious mind, so does our envy our jealousy, and our hatred. We don't choose any of these things. They are imposed upon us. Sometimes we do things that show incredibly bad judgment, things that might destroy our lives. How many times have you read about some rich, famous, highly accomplished person making an inconceivably stupid mistake and completely ruining their career? Yeah, I've people, seen that, yeah. yeah, people get addicted to drugs, people get addicted to gambling. These are also things that come from the unconscious mind. And so that's why I said that I don't like the word subconscious, because this is a force that is far more powerful than our conscious mind. And we've got to approach it with respect. So what does that tell one to do? I don't know. Do people really think about their unconscious mind at all? How do you interact with it? Are yeah. Exercises that you suggest or what are your thoughts? Yeah. So I think that the first step is, you know, ultimately what we need to do is join forces with it and sort of make friends with it. And I think that there are a few things we can do to promote that. We've got to think about it as its own entity. And if you want to make friends with someone or something, the first thing to do is to get to know it. There have been research. There's research on the unconscious mind that helps you to get to know it better. One book I like a lot is Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. It really encapsulates a lot of what we know from a scientific approach about the unconscious. 
The one thing I don't like about it, though, is that it looks at it purely from a negative standpoint, how the unconscious mind interferes with our ability to make rational decisions. So that's a big caveat. But in addition to science, there's another way to get to know the unconscious mind, which I talk about in Spellbound. And that is looking at the ancient traditions of magic and the supernatural. The reason why that's helpful it is because the unconscious mind is so much more powerful than the unconscious mind. Most supplements are taken on faith and can take weeks or months to have an effect. Even supplements backed by scientific studies may or may not deliver those same benefits to you. But what if you could feel the results of what you took within just a few days? Lost Empire Herbs offers the highest quality, wild-harvested, non-irradiated pine pollen, and that can dramatically impact your hormones fast. Right now, you can grab it for one cent plus shipping and handling at GeniusPollen.com. That when it's activated and it expresses itself over us, uh, and, and that could be throwing us into a passion, giving us enthusiasm, making us, putting us in the zone during an athletic performance. When that happens, it feels as if an outside force is acting on us because we know very well that this is not something we're choosing to do. This is a gift that's coming from somewhere else. And the ancients attributed these to gods and spirits and demons. And the mythology, the fairy tales, the folklore that they came up with actually represent extremely sophisticated explorations of the relationship between the conscious and the unconscious minds. And, and that's what I talk about in Spellbound. I talk about fairy tales. I talk about alchemy, the tarot, numerology, and how becoming familiar with these esoteric disciplines can take us down the pathway of getting to understand the deepest aspects of ourselves in a better way. Hmm. Okay. Um, have, I don't know. Are there any guides or practical guides to, I don't even know what it means to tap into your unconscious mind, but to, I don't know to kind of have more of an understanding of how it works and employ it and use it in your daily interactions and you know how you go about your day Any yeah. suggestions there. Yeah. So as I said, the first step is to better understand what it is you're dealing with from both a scientific and a, a metaphorical point of view. And, and by the way, I think the metaphorical, the traditions of the supernatural and magic, much more rich and much more useful. So, so that's the first step. The second step is just to start to pay attention to the role of your own unconscious in your life. Um, pay attention to when thoughts come into your mind unbidden, when you experience different emotions, under what circumstances do they come, and what do the emotions lead you to do? What kinds of attitudes do they promote? Pay attention to when you are gifted enthusiasm and creativity and when you are stuck in the doldrums and you're just bored and uninspired. These are things that are going to help you get to know your own unconscious better. And one thing we have to realize is just as the conscious mind has goals, things that we want to get accomplished, so does the unconscious mind. Sometimes they're similar to the conscious mind, but most of the time they're not. And by paying attention to the role of the unconscious mind in our lives, we can start to get a sense of its goals and see if we can find a way to work that in to our own conscious plans. So, you know, th this isn't like a strategy of, you know, drink eight glasses of water per day or something simple like that. It it's hard. It's hard. And I kind of believe that the larger the goal, the harder the path it's going to be. And I'm always very suspicious of people who have shortcuts. So mm -hmm. I am not offering any kind of shortcut. This is a very, very difficult, lifelong kind of a project but it has very, very big payoffs. Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. 
The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations uh, to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems uh, because I've seen them explode recently after the, uh, you know, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously. Give us a thumbs up. And check in the description for Buy Me a Coffee. It's about five bucks. If you could buy me a coffee, I'd really appreciate it. It would help keep the channel going. And I love coffee. Thank you. Well, what do you think those payouts will be? What, what kind of understanding do you think will be created by your work? Yeah. Um, so the conscious mind primarily works through rationality. And rational thought is an incredibly powerful way of thinking. I mean, human beings are the only animals who have it probably, uh, or, or possibly other animals have it in more primitive ways. We're, we're the most sophisticated rational thinkers in the animal kingdom. And that has um, allowed us to, to, to really master the world in, in ways that have been wonderful, lifting millions of people out of poverty in other ways that have been not so wonderful, though, and that is ecological destruction, um, weapons that can destroy all of humanity, and those kinds of less favorable things. The unconscious is responsible for things in human beings that bring us a little bit closer to animals, our instincts, our emotions, as I said, our level of energy. If you cut yourself off from those things, you essentially become a bloodless calculating machine. And I think that we all know people like that who are frightened of their emotions. They're frightened of their more instinctual reactions to things, and they try to put up a wall. And that's not a great idea because the problem is that they miss out on the richness that those things bring to their life. The other thing is that instead of those instinctual emotional reactions to life coming out in sophisticated ways, they come out in incredibly primitive ways. And so people who cut themselves off from their unconscious will explode with rage in an uncontrollable way, or they will be unable to cope with stresses like humiliation, which we all suffer, failure. They will have low resilience when things go wrong. And so the benefit of doing this is that you become a more complete, more whole person in which you don't just rely on rational thought to get you through life, but you also trust that your emotional reactions and your instincts are going to come through for you when you need them. And if I give you an example of that, I did a TEDx talk on an earlier book I wrote, uh, The Molecule of More, and I practiced that talk every day for a month because I had to memorize it. It was only 15 minutes, but I'm not good at memorizing. Huh. So I, I practice it every day for a month. I, I get to the talk. We do a dress rehearsal. Halfway through the talk, I draw a blank and I'm stuck. I, I'm up there on the stage, dress rehearsal, sweating bullets. I can't think of anything. And it's an utter failure. So the next day I'm getting ready to go on. And I say to myself, look, I wasn't lazy about this. I didn't shirk. I didn't cut corners. I did everything I consciously could, and it still wasn't enough. And, and so I said to my unconscious mind, look, we're all in this together. Come through for me when I need you. And, and as it turned out, I remembered all of my lines, and it went well. And so we need our unconscious mind. We're not capable of achieving our goals on our own. And so there's a lot of value of trying to get to know those entities in there and maintain a good relationship with them. So are there particular exercises or things you can do? Or is this just a case of, you know, listen to your gut, you know, the proxy for your unconscious mind or meditate? Well, I, or I mean, what, what yeah, I think it's both. I think it's both. I, I think that there is a big part of listen to your gut. And maybe that might be worth talking to, or talking about a little bit. Um, I, I think that most people think about gut feelings 
as primitive and perhaps even untrustworthy. But there's been some fascinating experiments that demonstrate the sophistication of gut feelings. And let me give you an example. There, there was something called the Amsterdam apartment test in which they gave research volunteers descriptions of three apartments and the volunteers had to decide which one was best. Now, that's something the rational mind could very easily do if there weren't too many factors involved. But the researchers specifically made this very, very hard. And they gave them um, 10 descriptions, descriptions of 10 different aspects of the departments, like the size, the location, how nice the landlord was, the price, et cetera, et cetera. And they mixed them up. They gave it to them in random order to make it very, very hard uh, for the conscious mind to manage. And then they divided the people into three groups. The first group had to choose the, apart the best apartment right away. They basically had to make a snap decision. The second group was allowed to think about it for two minutes. They got to use their conscious rationality to try to figure out the best answer. And the third group was distracted for two minutes. They had to do anagrams. Uh, and, and anagrams, that's, that's where you have to uh, rearrange letters in random order to make a, a word. And when they're difficult, they take up all of your conscious processing. So with this third group, they weren't allowing the conscious mind to work on the problem as the second group did, but they were giving the unconscious mind two minutes to run through the problem. And that was the group that was most likely to pick the most desirable apartment. So, you know, I, I think that we, we have a kind of arrogance with our conscious mind. We think it's best at problem solving. But when things are very, very complicated, when there's a lot of variables at play, the gut feeling we get is going to be the best. And, and I think many of us have experienced that. I, I remember when I was looking at colleges, I was absolutely overwhelmed by how many variables I had to juggle in my mind. Who had the best location? Who had the best ranking? Who had the best dormitories, libraries, dining halls? And, and it was absolutely impossible to rationally think about all of those different things. Um, but anybody who's faced a decision like that knows that at some point you've got a gut feeling about which one is right, and that's what you go with. Is there any way to cultivate, I don't know, the abilities of your unconscious mind and to sharpen your gut feelings besides just listening to them? I, mean, I don't know. Is anyone studying this? Yes. Yes. When you want to open yourself up to the unconscious mind, and there are two challenges associated with doing that. One is that the conscious mind is constantly, constantly chattering away inside your head, right? I, I, do you experience kind of a running commentary going through your mind at all times? I don't. My wife you don't? Says she, you know, yeah, I don't. I don't know. I guess my mind's quieter than, than some people. But my, my wife says things will be on her mind and they flash in her head all the time. Sometimes it does, but a lot of times it's just quiet. I'm just thinking of one thing, but it's not like a cacophony of stuff. Wow, that's fantastic. And let me ask you this. Do you tend to pay attention to uh, what it is that you're doing at, at any particular moment? I try, but I definitely feel like my mind has been scrambled a lot by you know use of the phone and I don't really use social media, but definitely my attention span has been... Uh, been reduced a lot and I hate that. So I try to fix it and, you know, pay attention, but it's a constant pull of, uh, I don't even know what it is. I guess thoughts come to mind sometimes and uh, pulls me away. It depends. You know, when you're not paying attention to the task at hand, we call it mind wandering. And there's an interesting study in which they, they sent text messages to people at random times throughout the day and asked them if they were paying attention to the, the task at hand. And they also asked them how happy they felt. And what they found was that people were mind wandering about 50% of their day. And when they were mind wandering, they were much less happy than then when they were paying attention to what they were doing. So, so we tend to mind wander. But if you want to be sensitive 
be alert to what your unconscious mind is doing, you've got to try to minimize that. You've got to try to be alert in the moment to not only what's going on around you, but also what's going on inside of you. So that's the first challenge, to lengthen your attention span, to not always be bouncing around from social media site to news site, to thinking about a conversation you had earlier, to all kinds of stuff. The ability to stay in the moment and notice what your mind is doing that is not coming from from you, but is just happening spontaneously. So that's challenge number one. The second challenge is that the stuff that comes from the unconscious mind, as I mentioned, tends to be primitive and strong. And a lot of times we don't like it. And so we close it off. We protect ourselves from these kind of instinctual reactions because they're too strong. And so the second thing is that we need to make our ability to tolerate upsetting ideas and upsetting emotions because because it's going to be good and bad that's coming up. And in the beginning, it tends to be more bad than good. And we've got to be able to tolerate these things. And so we've got to strengthen the mind. And as you probably know, the single best way to strengthen the mind is through meditation. So meditation is probably the best way to prepare your mind for developing a stronger relationship with your unconscious. Hmm, okay. So have you meditated or have you studied meditators? And you know, what have you noticed about when you say mind being strengthened or connection being strengthened, what does that look like? How does it manifest in your life? Yeah. So I started meditating when I was writing my previous book, The Molecule of More. One of the main themes is the tension within our brains between planning for the future and living in the present moment and how we tend to spend much more time thinking about the future, thinking about the things we don't have, but we want, thinking about the things that we're going to have to do later, thinking about ways that we can make our lives better rather than enjoying the hard things that we've already worked for. So I, I thought it would be a good thing if I could learn to spend a little bit more time in the present moment with a little bit more gratitude, a, a little bit more experiencing. So I started meditating. And as I was researching Spellbound, I realized more and more just how important and just how valuable that is. So one of the things it does is, is it strengthens our mind to resist mind wandering, which is very, very difficult. Uh, that is not a trivial task. Most people, I mean, we can do it for long stretches of time if our unconscious is in charge and, and giving that to us as a gift. And we call that the flow state. You're familiar with the flow state, yes? Yeah, I've heard books from uh, Stephen Collar about flow. And uh, he talks about it for athletes. It'd be nice if it was for, let's say, you know, I don't know, people that study or trying to do classes or, you know, other pursuits. But, you know, his talk on, how, on athletes, yeah, I just don't know how to translate it to other pursuits. Yeah, well, it, it is relevant to, I would say, any pursuit at all. You know, I, I lecture at the university, and so I spend a lot of time making PowerPoint slides. And this may be an indication of what a nerd I am, but I love making PowerPoint slides. Um, I, I love the creativity involved. I, I love hunting down great photos or great videos. I, I love thinking about how my students are going to understand what I'm doing. And that will put me in the flow state. I will get in the flow state sometimes when I'm writing. It's even possible to get in the flow state when you're, when you're gardening, cooking, knitting, doing housework. Basically, what the flow state is, is when you are absolutely in the present moment, so absorbed in what you're doing that you lose your sense of self. And it's one of the most productive, one of the most pleasurable states that you can be in. Thinking about it reframed in that way, you know, just simply so absorbed in your task that you lose your sense of self, you lose your sense of time. Does that sound familiar, like something you've experienced? Yeah, usually it's, a, yeah. I mean, there's, right, there's definitely times where, um, I don't know, I've enjoyed a comedy show and it goes so quick, or again, I'll be doing some kind of sport and you just feel great and happy. And again, uh, you just get a, a sense of, um, 
a loving life, I guess I would call it, you know, really yeah. enjoying. Yeah, that's right. That's right. When you're playing sports and you enter into it, it you are just on. And I'm not much of an athlete, but it has happened to me a few times. And the one thing that I notice is that when I'm not in the flow state, I have to struggle like crazy to, to perform, to, to get the moves right, et cetera, et cetera. When I'm in the flow state, it's absolutely effortless. And I think that mm. that's one reason why the ancients attributed it to gods and goddesses. When ancient Greek athletes performed like that, they attributed it to the, the Greek goddess of victory, whose name happened to be Nike, which is kind of a crazy coincidence. Yeah, I could see, right. Or you, or you say like someone's, um, I don't know, someone has a hot hand or they're inspired or, yeah, they're, um, I don't exactly. know, they're playing like a demon or they're, they're oh, yeah. running like a bat out of hell or those kinds of things. Yeah. Some oh, of those exactly. descriptions are coming to mind, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, th this whole supernatural attribution has really embedded itself in our language. Like, for example, we talked earlier about the unconscious making us do stupid things. We might say, oh, my God, I don't know what got into him. You know, almost like there's this supernatural possession that occurs. And yet it's absolutely in the language. And, and you mentioned inspiration. Most people, when they've experienced inspiration, they know they act as if they were possessed by some supernatural force. Artists, when they're inspired, will work for days and days and days. They may not eat. They may not sleep. They may not take showers. They lock their door and nobody can get out. It truly feels like a supernatural possession. And um, a lot of the time, it's very, very pleasurable. Well, I mean, it would probably be a lot more exciting to be able to access flow instead of just your unconscious mind. But I mean, have you, you, know, have you found techniques that that help answer the question, well, kind of the question I posed or the lament that, uh, you know, for athletes, it seems to be easy and accessible, but for other endeavors, how do you get into it? Yeah, I, I, I disagree about the athletes. Um, you know, an athlete goes out on the field and they have no idea how they're going to perform that day. Um, athletes are just as likely to have bad days you know, in, in which an easy pass bounces off their fingertips or an easy catch bounces off their glove. That's just as likely to happen as having an inspired day when they are absolutely in the zone. And interestingly, one of the consequences of that, and I don't know if you know this, is that athletes are among the most superstitious people there are. Uh, I, I don't know if you've ever read about some of the crazy superstitions that athletes have. No, what are, what are some, I know like rock stars, you know, hearing about whatever rock star didn't want brown M&Ms in their, you know, <laughs> in the bowls, in their hotel, you know, that's maybe not superstition, but just being petty. But yeah, what, what kind of rituals have you seen that are important to athletes and why? So um, I think the most famous one is uh, Michael Jordan. Every single game he played in the NBA, he wore his North Carolina Tar Heels shorts underneath them for good luck. And if you look at old films of basketball, they were very small, tight shorts that look ridiculous today. Michael Jordan was the first one to wear these big, baggy, long shorts. And it's because he had his other shorts on underneath. Wade Boggs, ba baseball player, used to run sprints at exactly 7.17 in the evening before night games. And he had a ritual of eating chicken every single time before a game. I can't think about them off the top of my head. Tom Brady, middle-aged quarterback, carried protection stones every time he went out on the field that his wife gave him so that he, he wouldn't be destroyed by the defensive linebackers. So there have been studies of this. Athletes are more superstitious than the general population. Pro athletes are more superstitious than amateurs. And elite athletes like Brady, Boggs, and uh, Jordan, they are the most superstitious of all. And, and the reason is, is because they depend on their unconscious mind. You know, the conscious mind loves to control things. And, and so much of what we do is trying to gain control over our lives. On a very basic level, we build houses so we can control the temperature and stay dry when it rains. 
We build transportation so that we can go wherever we want. Uh, we have cell phones that we're constantly provided with the information we need to control our environment. But people who depend the most on their unconscious mind, athletes, artists, writers, they understand that, that the most important things are beyond their control. And among the many ways they deal with that is by becoming superstitious. So, it, you know, so, so I, I fully understand the desire behind your question. How do you get control over this incredibly valuable resource? And the answer is you're barking up the wrong tree. The and way you're doing the same thing at this time, et cetera. Yeah. The way to, to benefit from it is to admit that you don't have control over it and treat this entity as an equal and try to have a little bit of trust. And when it doesn't come through for you, you got to say, all right, it decided not to come through for me today. It probably has a good reason for that. I'm not going to get frustrated. I'm not going to get angry. I'm going to hope that it comes through for me the next time. And, and let me give you an example of that. So I've done incredibly stupid things, as we all have, like closing a document I've been working on for an hour without saving it. I, have you ever done that? Close something you've been working on and you've lost hours of oh, work? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's terrible. Yeah. yeah. And what do you say to yourself when you do that? So stupid. Why'd you do that for me? Exactly. That's the same thing I say. I say, oh my God, you are such a loser. How could you be so stupid? So, so here's an interesting question. Who are you talking to? You're not talking to your conscious mind. And the reason is that you didn't make a conscious decision to do it. You did it inadvertently. And so what you're doing is you're talking to your unconscious mind. And you're setting up a really bad relationship by speaking it to that way. And, and so it's something you should avoid. Now, let me ask you another question. How many times, well, this doesn't happen too often, but has this ever happened where you've closed a document without saving it, lost tons of work after you stop yelling at yourself, you buckle down and redo it, and it's much, much better than the first one. Has that ever happened? Yeah, yeah that's happened because... I feel a time pressure and I feel like, all right, I've, I've already written it. So it's kind of easier. I know what I'm going to write in a way, but again, I also feel a time pressure and I also feel like, I don't know, some outside third person is looking over my shoulder saying, better do it right this time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the second time you do something, you it's usually better. So here's what I believe. I don't believe that that was an accident. I believe that when that happens, my unconscious mind is saying, look, you may think this is good enough, but I disagree. Do it again. And oftentimes it's right. And, and oftentimes the unconscious mind doesn't just destroy my work. It helps me rebuild it because as I'm doing it again, new ideas pop into my mind. I don't create those ideas myself. They pop in in a form of inspiration. And, and so it's there. It's helping out. It's saying, look, it wasn't good enough. Let's work on this again together. And it's difficult. It's difficult to control your temper, but sometimes you just got to trust that it knows what it's doing. That's a good way to look at it. I like that. Yeah. Why did you close out the document? Well, something better came of it. So there's a reason for it. That's, that's there, a good idea. There's a reason for it. Yeah. And, you know, Sigmund Freud, who is one of the pioneers of the study of the unconscious mind, didn't believe in accidents. Uh, or, or if we do have accidents, he thought they were very, very rare. You know, when you look at people dropping valuable things or things that are inexplicable, he, he said, there's a reason for it. You're not doing it intentionally, but something is doing it intentionally. And that's the unconscious mind. And, and I tend to agree with that. I don't think there are a lot of accidents. I think the unconscious plays a bigger role in our life than we're willing to admit. Well, no, no, that's good. When you, when I realized you're right, we're, we're yelling at our unconscious mind and blaming it. You know, I don't know. I don't know how, how analogous it is to a real relationship that you can hurt by being mean to the other person. But what do you think happens if, if people are dismissive of their unconscious mind versus, you know, how is it trying to help me and working with it? What do you think happens to them over time? Yeah. So when we when we talk about the intentions of the unconscious mind, we often describe them as drives. And, you know, you've probably heard the term instinctual drives. And so if we get 
so the contents of the unconscious are going to come out one way or the other. You know, you can't suppress your instincts long term. You can do it in a given situation, but eventually it's going to come out. If you've got a good relationship with your unconscious, if you've gotten in the habit of paying attention to spontaneous ideas, emotions, feelings, urges, accidents that happen, and those sorts of things, the drives are going to come out in manageable ways. But if you're constantly suppressing your unconscious, saying, you idiot, get out of my life, stay away, you don't belong here, it's going to come out in more primitive ways, bursts of emotions, more mistakes. You're going to you're going to misperceive other people, misinterpreting neutral remarks as aggressive. And you're going to run into all kinds of terrible, terrible problems. And so it's not a good idea to set up that kind of relationship. You know, we've all been in a situation in which somebody seems to get angry at us for no reason. And we're like, what the heck is going on with this person? And probably what's going on is they're experiencing unconscious drives that is distorting the person's view of us. Just like the unconscious can distort other people in positive ways. If you've ever met a celebrity, you didn't perceive the actual human being. You perceived kind of this demigod that your unconscious projected upon that person. It can also go the other way. If there is someone in your life who you really, really don't like, somebody who pushes all your buttons and just irritates the heck out of you, the odds are that person is not nearly as bad as you think they are. And that a good part of it is unconscious, what we call projection, the unconscious distorting your view of that person. Having a good relationship with your unconscious allows you to recognize those things and to move past that distortion so we do a better job of seeing people for who they really are. And that can have a very positive effect on our relationships. It makes sense. So is there a training? I mean, so you mentioned meditation, which is, I'm sure it's great, but is there a unconscious, conscious specific training that you've developed or is out there that people can use? Yeah, I think as we've seen, it's very complicated and it's a very, very deep topic. I I hope I'm not being too self-serving here, but I would say the first step is read my book, Spellbound. That is an overview. And then where you go from there, I I think depends on what feels right to you. Some people may find it useful to um, go back and read some fairy tales and think about it in the context that I, uh, I lay out in Spellbound. Some people might download a meditation app like Headspace or Calm, which are both outstanding. See if they can start to uh, develop the discipline of meditation. And, and by the way, when you start doing meditation, with Headspace at least, you're basically asked to devote three minutes a day. And this app starts you from an absolute beginner's level. So it's something that anybody can do. Um, Other people might find other aspects of the book lead them um, along a path of starting to cultivate this aspect of themselves. I would say that there are as many ways to do it as there are individuals on this planet. And that one of the things about getting to know your unconscious and cultivating that relationship is that it brings out your individuality. People who reject their unconscious often don't have a good sense of who they truly are on a very deep level. And that leads them to kind of put on masks. It makes them try and act in ways that they think are socially desirable or they act like people they wish they were, instead of the more fruitful task of trying to get to know who they really are and trying to become that authentic person. You know, I, you know, we're constantly hearing people say, oh, be yourself, as if that were something that were easy. But learning who you are and learning how to be your authentic self is a task that we can struggle with over the course of a lifetime and struggle in very, very fruitful and productive ways. And so I think a lot of this is becoming an individual, 
and finding the path that works best for you. And I think that starting with Spellbound is a really good place to start. Okay. Well, very good, Daniel. What, so Spellbound's a good start for people to find out more about your work in general. Where can they go? Uh, so um, they can go to my website, danielzlieberman.com. Uh, they might be interested in The Molecule of More. That's a book about dopamine, which is the sexiest brain chemical there is. And uh, I, a lot of people have had a lot of fun with that book. And I've also got a YouTube channel, Daniel Z. Lieberman, MD, where I've got a bunch of short videos addressing uh, issues of the unconscious, issues of dopamine, and psychiatric issues in general. Okay, very good. Well, Daniel, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks so much, Richard. It's been a pleasure. Remember, before you go, to grab your one penny bag of pine pollen for all the amazing all natural hormonal support that men and women the world over are raving about. Try it out and see how it works for you. All you have to do is head to geniuspollen.com to grab your bag today. Within days, you may be able to notice greater energy, more focus, added recovery, and more. Again, please visit geniuspollen.com to learn more now. Thank you.